Okay, guys, good evening to everybody. Uh, is everybody logged in? Uh, there's a request for a lot more. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yes. sir. Okay, good. And uh, can you also see my slide? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, Nikhil, can you just take over to make sure people get admitted into the meeting? There are a lot of people requesting. I don't know, this is a new uh new thing from 
from Zoom. So just uh, in between, go to the controls and see if you can admit the people into the meeting. Uh, yes, sir. Right now there are 84. We have a few more login, 85. Yeah, but you, you, you keep admitting them in because they cannot uh, log in until and unless you admit them. Okay. Uh, That's the new security issue there. So just go to that manage participants and then just say admit. Participant. Let me first pause the recording. The recording is. Okay, we'll just wait for a few more minutes. Uh, I think uh, the moment we reach capacity, I'll start. Problem is once I start the lecture, then I can't uh, manage all this. Yes, sir. Uh, I... I'm just uh, weaving, uh, where is that manage participants? But in the participants, I can't, I just see okay. it on raise hand. Don't worry, don't worry. Probably you're not allowed, so. Okay, we've reached capacity, so somebody will. 98 now, 99. Oh, we've got 100. Okay, come on now, let's just start, okay? All right, so good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to another lecture of uh, the Thoracic Guru's uh, website. Uh, we will now look at today at uh, malignant SVC obstruction or malignant SVC syndromes. Uh, just one second. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Okay, so we're going to look at uh, malignant SVC obstruction. Sir, start recording. Sir, please, uh, recording. please record, sir. Please record, uh, sir. Recording. Thank you. Thank you. One minute. Just a minute. Where is it? Uh, is, uh, resume recording. And sir, a little louder. We can't hear you properly. A little louder. All right. Okay. I'll speak up a bit. My volume uh, may be low. Okay. All right. Let's let's get on with it. All right. We're we're at hundred participants. So let's get on. Okay. So today I'm going to talk about malignant superior vena cava obstruction, or uh, also called as SVC syndrome. Uh, quite a straightforward topic, actually. Not very complicated. Uh, most of you have come across this. Most of you probably understand the principles of management, but uh, it will be a good revision for all of us to go through, particularly for the exam going people, uh, because a couple of MCQs actually come from this. Uh, and I can point out to you where the MCQ uh, lies in the lecture. So it, it is something which you can definitely get 100% in the MCQ. So uh, it's worthwhile revising this topic with me. Uh, there is no real guideline on this, okay? There is no real guideline out there because it's not a very common disease. Uh, so they really haven't got enough randomized control studies or whatever. But the one paper in the literature which has actually given you a very good uh, uh, analysis of the SVC syndrome is, is this one, which got published in 2011 by Lepper uh, and uh, Hamacher's Dizia group. Uh, and uh, they have spoken very well about the SVC obstruction, particularly talking about the malignant uh, SVC obstruction. So I'll try and talk you through the malignant SVC obstruction and try to make you understand uh, what is needed for the exams. Uh, one minute. What is in my... Let me move this out of the way so you can see better. Okay, so... Uh, SVC obstruction is, SVC syndrome, as we call it, is, is a conglomeration of uh, symptoms secondary to SVC obstruction. Again, before I start, can you just switch off your microphone, everybody? There are some microphones on, so I, I am getting distracted. Uh, uh, switch off microphones, guys. Okay, the obstruction can be intravascular or the obstruction can be extravascular, okay? So this is important to realize because the pathology can be outside the SVC or the pathology can be in the SVC. Any of this can cause an occlusion of the SVC and give you a set of symptoms which together perform the complex called as SVC syndrome, okay? So the extravascular compression is usually because of a rigid pathology outside the SVC. The SVC is a collapsible structure 
And any pathology which is rigid outside the SVC can start to cause compressing on the SVC. And in fact, uh, symptoms do not really ap appear almost up to the point when the patient is uh, almost 90 to 95% compressed. And that is when you start getting SVC symptoms. But predominantly the SVC uh, accommodates the pressure that comes from outside. And the commonest pressure which comes from outside, as we all know, is a tumor. Any tumor in the anterior mediastinal uh, area can cause it. And we know there are four specific tumors in the anterior mediastinum, which are the four T's, which are called as uh, thymic tumors, uh, which is thymomas, or they can be uh, thyroid, which is a retrosternal uh, goiter, or they can be T-cell lymphoma, or they can be teratoma or a germ cell tumor. So these are the four which are commonly present in the anterior mediastinum. And these will cause compression on the SVC from the medial side because they lie medial to the SVC. Uh, the one thing that will cause compression from the lateral side is usually lymph nodes. So the other cause for compression of the SVC and extravascular compression will be inflammation or fibrosis. And inflammation of fibrosis can be seen either in mediastinal uh, sclerosing fib uh, fibrosis or in uh, tuberculosis or in sarcoidosis. So any of these can actually give rise to an inflammatory response, which might actually cause compression on the SVC. The intravascular component, which usually will cause SVC uh, obstruction is thrombus, okay? Uh, other very rare things like intravascular tumors uh, are not very common at all uh, within the SVC. So we don't uh, really talk about that. But nowadays, because interventional cardiology, interventional radiology has become so uh, widespread, the incidence of thrombus has gone up quite dramatically. So very often you see the obstruction of the SVC secondary to a th thrombus, which is usually secondary to an intravascularly placed device. Okay, so you will see that as we talk along. So let's start off with the very basics as we always do. So what is the anatomy of the SVC? Uh, SVC lies in the superior mediastinum. Everybody knows the location of the SVC. The length is usually about five to seven centimeters long, okay? And it, if you ask for the external or the surface anatomy of the SVC, it extends from the costochondral junction of the first rib to the third rib on the right side. So this is the superficial anatomy or the surface anatomy of the SVC. Uh, it forms from by a fusion of the right and the left brachiocephalic vein. Uh, the right brachiocephalic vein is formed by a fusion of the right internal jugular and the subclavian vein. Uh, the left is formed again by the left internal jugular and the left subclavian vein, okay? The azygous vein is the only real structure which drains directly into the SVC. So on the right side, the azygous vein comes across uh, and drains into the SVC just before it enters into the right atrium. The mission of the SVC is to transport blood from the head, neck, and upper extremities. And importantly, it carries almost one third of the venous return. But the problem is not that it carries one third venous return. The problem is the areas from which it carries venous return are very, very critical, mainly the brain. So anything that causes SVC obstruction will cause back pressure changes and it's not such a good idea for the patient. Okay, uh, SVC, as we said, drains into the right atrium. Right. I'm getting repeated messages that people are waiting. Uh, what is the message? Uh, Okay, all right. Now let's carry on and, oh, sorry. So let's look at the picture. The picture is very, very simple, very easy to understand. The IJV, right, left, SV, uh, subclavian vein joining to form the brachiocephalic. And on the right side, the uh, on the left side, the left brachiocephalic coming down. These are the internal thyroid uh, veins which brain into the left brachiocephalic and together they join. The azygous, as we know, joins it here to the, to the lateral side of the SVC, okay? So azygous is really one of the main things that drains into the SVC. But the important thing is not just the azygous. The important thing is to understand the 
anatomy of the collaterals of the SVC. So there are many, many collaterals which are present, which when the SVC is blocked, they open up and uh, manage to dissipate the pressure. So the important collaterals that we have are the collaterals of the azygous vein. Uh, we have the intercostal veins. All of the intercostal veins we know drains into the azygous and the hemiazygous arch system. Uh, we have the internal thoracic uh, vein, and then we have the abdominal vein, which is the epigastric, the superior and the inferior epigastric uh, veins, which actually uh, will show back pressure changes when the SVC is uh, compressed. So there is a whole system network of collaterals. Hence, uh, the, the back pressure changes, if it happens slowly, there is always enough time for the collaterals to open up. And so the patient may not be very symptomatic till very late. It really takes a lot of the SVC to be compressed, almost more than 95% before the patient really starts to become symptomatic because the collaterals open up. Of course, if there's an acute uh, obstruction of the SVC secondary to a thrombus, then there is not enough time for the collaterals to uh, open up and those will actually cause compromise in the patient, a clinical compromise. So if a patient uh, acutely goes off, always think of intravascular problems rather than extravascular because extravascular slowly increase and compress. Intravascular come in suddenly like a thrombus. Uh, so what happens is when you get obstruction of the SVC, there is increase in the venous pressure, there is back pressure and edema of the head and neck and upper extremities, predominantly caused by tumors in the mediastinum. And uh, the cardiac output is reduced acutely. If the cardiac output is reduced acutely, it usually means that there is a intravascular uh, compression. Whenever there's an extravascular compression or it's a slow compression, there will always be collateralization. The general uh, papers that have looked at all this have said that the hemodynamic changes that happen are due to mass effect on the heart rather than the SVC obstruction. So it's not really the SVC obstruction directly which will cause, particularly in extravascular compression, it's not the SVC obstruction, but because the tumor is increasing and causing pressure on the heart, that is what causes hemodynamic compromise in these patients. And so that's important to remember, okay? Now let's look at what are the etiologies of this, of SVC syndrome. Historically, before uh, the, you know, 2000s and 1980s and 90s, historically, the major etiology was syphilis always. It was syphilis and tuberculosis. Almost 15 to 40 percent uh, was secondary to syphilis. And syphilis classically was secondary because of syphilitic aortic aneurysms. So you got uh, syphilitic, syphilitic aortitis and then the aorta became aneurysmal and in, increased in size and that caused the compression of the SVC and subsequently caused SVCO. But nowadays we don't see syphilis Tuberculosis is also because the drug and medications have become pretty good and we start treating these patients pretty early. So infective complications are lesser. Uh, the more common complications now are because of tumors. So 90% of patients are because of tumors. 30% uh, actually are thrombotic complications. In the previous generation, we did not see that many thrombotic complications. And most of the thrombotic complications that we see now are because of intravascular devices. Because more and more catheters are being put, more angioplasties are being done, uh, and uh, various other uh, devices are being used. Hence, you're seeing a lot more intravascular thrombotic events. So this is an example of a syphilitic aortitis uh, and a, a large aneurysm of the uh, arch of the aorta, which is going up and compressing on the SVC. This is an area of the SVC. Can you see that? That's being compressed. and uh, this is the one that used to be seen in the last century, but not, not anymore. These days, we don't see them. They're very rare. The other uh, areas which can compress on the SVC is thoracic outlet uh, tumors. Thoracic outlet tumors come from the lateral side. All other tumors, I said, come from the medial side. So the thoracic outlet tumor or uh, like a 
neuroma, schwannoma, or a pancos tumor. Any of these can actually cause compression on the SVC. Uh, another important uh, type of tumor which happens in this area is germ cell tumors. Where I have seen quite a few germ cell tumors lateral to the SVC which are growing and causing compression on the SVC. So it is something that you have to keep in mind when you're trying to evaluate a patient with SVC syndrome. The important thing is very often the patients have no symptoms of the tumor and the first symptom that appears is SVC obstruction. So it is uh, really surprising how much the patient can take before the symptoms appear. This is uh, an angiogram showing you the obstruction very clearly uh, below the uh, brachiocephalus. The left brachiocephalus is coming here and the SVC is forming almost like a rat tail, okay? So this is something that you have to keep in mind. So other etiologies that you will see are fibrosing mediastinitis. Um, I, I have seen a few fibrosing mediastinitis causing SVC compression. It's a very difficult condition because really there is no real treatment for the underlying cause. Very often we don't even know what is causing the fibrosing mediastinitis. Uh, there is some evidence that histoplasma capsulatum uh, predisposes the patient for uh, uh, for fibrosing mediastinitis. But again, the treatment with SVC uh, syndrome usually is just stenting. There's very little you can do for the fibrosing mediastinitis if it has reached that stage. Uh, of course, tuberculosis, actinomycosis, aspergilloma, uh, blastomycosis can all cause SVC syndromes. Uh, Bancrofti, filariasis, or nocardia, all of these can either form primary masses which will compress or can affect the lymph nodes which can cause a lymphadenopathy and cause compression of the SVC. The one thing that has actually been uh, seen more recently, uh, particularly in the last 10 years or so, is post-radiation of lo uh, and local vascular fibrosis, either secondary to AF ablation surgery or secondary to radiotherapy to the mediastinum. And this is, this, is a, this is a new phenomenon. This wasn't reported previously in literature, but now more and more case studies are coming in. Uh, case reports are coming in. Uh, there is really not enough randomized controlled studies or anything like that in SVC syndromes. The malignancy that typically uh, affect uh, are, as we said, more than 85% to 90%. Uh, traditionally, it will be non-small cell lung cancer, uh, which uh, at the apex of the in the upper lobe, which will compress the SVC. You can have small cell lung cancer compressing the SVC, secondary to lymphadenopathy. Uh, you can have lymphomas uh, in that area and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So it's quite important not just to treat the SVC obstruction, but also to find out what is the underlying cause. And very often treatment of the underlying cause resolves the SVC obstruction. Uh, the other malignancies which we have seen are teratomas or germ cell tumors, primary germ cell tumors. Uh, mesothelioma can cause SVC obstruction, particularly by causing a fibrous reaction on the mediastinal pleura, and that will engulf the, uh, the SVC within uh, its growth, and that will cause SVC obstruction. Very, very poor prognosis when mesothelioma uh, causes SVC obstruction. And of course, we uh, lymph node metastasis. So anything that can cause the size of the lymph nodes to increase uh, can cause this problem. Uh, lymph node metastases in the mediastinum particularly can come from ovarian cancer and other diseases. So it's important to rule out these things. So here is a chart from the uh, paper. Uh, and this tells you very clearly the whole uh, list of... Uh, list of uh, diagnoses that can be, uh, that can be uh, present when you're dealing with an SVC obstruction. The important thing is this is a new one because RFA ablation for AF has been causing pulmonary artery stenosis and as a back pressure, it causes SVC uh, compression. So it is that, that's a new one. Again, thrombosis is a new one. Almost 30% nowadays we see thrombosis related and predominantly because of intervascular devices, catheters, electrolytes, uh, catheters, electrodes, and things like that that have been placed in the SVC. Okay, so that's uh, a little bit about the etiology of SVC syndromes or SVC obstruction. Uh, there are many grading systems available. It is important to grade the SVC obstruction. Uh, there are two or three ways you can grade it. One is you can grade it clinically depending upon the presence or absence of symptoms. And the second thing is you can grade it radiologically, 
depending upon the amount of uh, compression that is present in the SVC. Also, depending upon whether it is above the azygous, below the azygous, or at the azygous. So your report will actually tell you this is a grade two SVC. So when they say when they say grade two SVC obstruction, you need to know what is the grading system. So let's look at what are the grading systems. There's anatomical grading system, clinical grading system, and radiological grading system. Uh, so the anatomical grading system, which is present, is uh, a Dotty Stanford. This is a paper published uh, 2008, I think, and uh, it's a pretty good system which is used quite regularly. Uh, by James Doty, he was the first author, and it divides the stenosis into four types, uh, one, two, three, and four. Uh, one is 90% of supra-azygous SVC, uh, two is more than 90%, more than, so this is up to 90%, this is more than 90% of supra-azygous SVC. Uh, type three is complete occlusion of the SVC with azygous reverse blood flow, and four is complete as, uh, occlusion of the SVC with involvement of major tributaries and the azygous vein. So the, the, the obstruction is going into the azygous vein in type four, and those are not very good for the patient because they cause symptoms. So let's have a look at what is happening here. So here it is more than 90%. Uh, azygous is here, this is supra-azygous. So this is a type one, this would be a type two, 90 to 100% supra-azygous. Again, and the back pressure changes are being felt in the uh, left side. Uh, the accessory hemiazygous will actually uh, take up the collaterals. And um, if, if, the, if the obstruction continues, then you're losing the whole of the uh, lower end of the SUC plus the azygous. Again, the left side takes up more of the uh, pressure. So you get a back pressure change uh, down into the abdominal vessels as well. So intercostals bulge up. The abdominals bulge up, these uh, epigastric uh, vessels bulge up, and then up here, the back pressure will show on the head, neck, uh, and shoulder uh, veins. And then type D is where there is complete uh, loss of the azygous. In, in the previous one, there was still azygous coming in and being patent, but here the obstruction has gone into the azygous. So the whole of the system is blocked and now the whole of the chest wall collaterals have come up and internal mammary vein collaterals have come up. So this is a way you actually identify what is the severity of the, of the uh, obstruction. Uh, there is a radiological grading where they go from zero to four. Uh, again, more or less uh, the same, but only difference is grade one has been further divided into one A and one B, which is with collaterals and without collaterals. Uh, this is the one that is uh, the this is the one that's recommended with uh, most of us uh, use actually. This is based on the symptoms of the patient. This is more important clinically. The so you you got to look at the severity whether the patient is asymptomatic, mildly symptomatic, moderately symptomatic. But the last three are the important. If there is severe life threatening or fatal, these are the ones where you intervene in an emergency. These can be managed by treating the underlying cause. But the moment you get into this zone, uh, so SVC obstruction four and five, level four and five, that is when you have to acutely go in there and put in a stent so that you can reduce the uh, back pressure. You do not go for diagnosis first. You go for sorting out the SVC first because the patient is, doesn't give you enough time to do a biopsy and get a histology of what is causing the problem. And, and you'll be surprised because this is a slow insidious growth and suddenly it reaches a critical point. These patients may not present to you while they have mild to moderate symptoms and they end up suddenly acutely in your uh, emergency with severe shortness of breath, severe cerebral edema, headache, dizziness, and, and really critically ill. And so the first thing you do once you've done your CT scan is you just take them to the radiology room and put in an SVC stand. Uh, and that actually will save the patient's life. So this uh, grading is, is more important to us clinicians. Uh, so again, the same thing, but uh, it's, it's called as use classification um, and uh, similar uh, picture. But again, grade three, four, five is the one that you really need to uh, work at very, very urgently. Uh, there is a Bixby's classification for looking at surgical risk. This, is, this was 
prior to the era of uh, endovascular therapies. And so this was the ones where should you operate on these guys or should you not operate? Nowadays, we just stent them. But in those days, uh, because there was no stenting available, you had to look at whether the patient was low risk for surgery with no physical signs and symptoms or high risk for surgery with the presence of physical signs and symptoms. So it's very important to understand uh, what uh, system that you're using. So what are the clinical features of an SVC obstruction? Uh, normal JVP is five, as we know, five to seven. Uh, there will always be a lot of back pressure. So obviously JVP will increase, uh, will go up to 20 to 40 millimeters of mercury. Uh, as a result of which there will be edema of the head, neck, eyelids, upper torso and arms. You will know this for sure. You see the patient and you can diagnose an SVC syndrome. There will be grossly visible dilated veins which are not collapsing either on the chest wall or on the arms or it will be on the abdominal one, abdominal uh, wall. Uh, there will be cyanosis, there will be plethora, particularly in the sicker patients, grade three, four, and five. Uh, the worst is when you get edema of the larynx because they become acutely unwell and uh, they, they come in respiratory distress. So that is not a good idea. No, that's not a good situation. So anybody with edema, larynx or pharynx may need urgent intubation, uh, may sometimes need a tracheostomy, depending on what is happening. Uh, if, of course, the recurrent laryngeal nerve gets involved, um, he will have hoarseness. There will be evidence of cough, strider, dyspnea or dyspnea. All of this sometimes comes because of the presence of the tumor itself rather than SVC. Uh, obstruction. So it's kind of difficult to know what is causing what, but uh, between uh, the patient, he's, he's quite a sick patient. That's the bottom line. The SVC obstruction patient is a very sick patient when they turn up into your clinic. Uh, so you really need to act fast. So this is the classical, uh, you know, engorged collateralization on the neck, on the chest wall. It's really classical. Once you've seen one patient, you'll never forget this. And every time you see this patient in a clinic, you'll be able to diagnose it. Here is the epigastric collateralization. This is because of superior and inferior epigastric vein. There is a lot of back pressure and these vessels open up. Uh, so this is another idea. This is usually a little more advanced. The epigastric vessels don't open up that easily. Uh, because there's a long channel uh, of hemiazygous. So if the epigastric are starting to open up, start to worry that this is getting to be a serious problem. Uh, we said the JVP will be raised. Here is the JVP severely raised in the sick patient. Uh, there is a formation of these, uh, the, the capillaries, the venous capillaries open up. Uh, so it gives you like a telangiectasia uh, view. And this is usually seen in early uh, seen in uh, late cases where there is back pressure changes all the way up to the capillaries, okay? So before the veins come up, you get the telangiectasia and then the veins will start to come up. Uh, same thing, uh, you can see that the telangiectasia formed on the chest wall. So these are all signs. Uh, there is something called as infrared photography. If you do infrared photography, all of these dilated veins will be very clearly seen. But of course, you don't really need to do this nowadays. You have much better investigating tools, but there is uh, the availability of infrared photography. Of course, you'll get edema of all the surrounding tissues, head, neck, and uh, arm predominantly. I've deliberately not used a picture of the a photograph of the face because I don't want to identify a patient. So what are the life-threatening issues with SVCO? The life-threatening issues are cerebral edema, really problematic because the patient can go into confusion and coma. Uh, and that is that is a real, real problem. Uh, but the beauty is you reverse the SVC obstruction with a stent and a lot of this gets improves quite dramatically. Uh, again, the cardiac hemo, uh, uh, cardiac component can be compromised. Uh, you, you can get a hemodynamic compromise very quickly with the cardiac component. And that's not very good for the patient. So as you can see, they can be very, very severe things. Uh, the one thing which worries you is when these guys come up with papal edema, because papal edema is always an indication that there is a raised uh, ICP. So you got to be worried about papal edema. Uh, if patients complaining about blurred vision or uh, conjunctival suffusion, which means a congestion of the conjunctiva, then look into the papilla and uh, make sure that he hasn't got any papal edema or raised ICP. 
Uh, one unusual complication of an SVC is because of the back pressure, you can actually get esophageal varices uh, and the patient may actually present with uh, acute hemoptysis, uh, hematemesis. So this is uh, very unusual, but sometimes they come with hematemesis and you wonder what is the cause. And the moment you get into the investigative phase, you see something in the anterior mediastinum, which is actually obstructing the uh, SVC. So it, it is uh, very often these patients do not come with the primary pathology as, as with symptoms. They come with secondary uh, symptoms, secondary to obstruction of the SVC. So usually the diagnosis will be made late. Uh, here is the incidence of these things. Again, from that paper, the SVC in thoracic malignancy paper. So facial edema is the commonest thing you see uh, almost in 82%. Arm edema, distended neck veins, distended chest, chest veins. We spoke about that. Facial plethora, which means reddening of the face. Uh, visual symptoms, okay? So quite important. Uh, the respiratory symptoms we mentioned, almost 50% have cough or uh, dyspnea. Uh, and some of them have evidence of laryngeal edema because of the stridor. Uh, neurologically, again, with the back pressure because of the cerebral edema, you can have uh, these symptoms uh, all the way up to coma and even stroke. So you gotta be really careful when you're analyzing a patient with uh, SVC syndrome. So what are the collaterals? What open up on the chest wall? Uh, what opens up? The chest wall uh, veins open up, we said that. The azygous, hemiazygous, and the intercostal veins are the main areas which take the back pressure from off the SVC. Uh, the lower torso or uh, via the IVC might actually open up. Uh, there is the internal mammary veins uh, and the superior and inferior epigastric veins. All of these form a collateralization and they open up. I showed you the picture earlier. And if it is a very high back pressure, it can go all the way down into the femoral area. And even worse is when the back pressure goes into the vertebral area and causes spinal ischemia. So it's really, really something that you've got to think of carefully uh, and treat urgently if the patient comes in stage three, four, or five. All assessment starts with history and clinical examination. Uh, a very good uh, clinical examination will actually give you the diagnosis. I've already shown you all the signs that you can see in these patients. It is mandatory that all these patients have a cardiac evaluation and also a CNS evaluation because you want to know whether the cardiac uh, side of things are compromised or whether the patient has got subtle CNS symptoms. Very, very important because if either of these are present, then you very quickly want to get in and sort out the SVC before you look for the diagnosis. So it's very important to do a good cardiac and CNS evaluation. And the box standard simplest investigation would be a chest X-ray and a CECT, either of which uh, will give you a very good clue as to what is happening within the chest. So this is a chest X-ray showing a large mass of uh, lymph nodes in the paramedias, uh, parasternal area, but uh, lying on the SVC and causing compression of the SVC. So just a simple chest X-ray if interpreted well, will actually give you an idea of what is happening on the, on the SVC. Uh, a CT scan, uh, usually a contrast enhanced CT scan, very important because you want to see the SVC and here is a mass, a tumor right in the anterior mediastinum going all the way into the posterior mediastinum onto the left side as well, into the uh, subcarinal area as well. And the SVC is almost most uh, down to a narrow screen. If you see something like this, then the first thing which comes to mind is a lymphoma. You must try and rule out a lymphoma because the moment, you, here you don't even have to stent the SVC if he's not very symptomatic. Of course, if he's symptomatic, you'll have to stent it, but you might not get good uh, opening oh, of the SVC. <laughs> 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 Aray, yaar, switch, off, switch off your phone, yaar, Sumit. Switch off your uh, microphone, yeah. Okay, so very often if it's a lymphoma, it's a good diagnosis because you give chemotherapy and the guy uh, 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 responds very well and the SVC obstruction will go away. So it's important to understand the pathology. Uh, you can do CT venography. CT venography will actually help you to identify where the channels are coming and what are, uh, what are the back pressure changes and you can clearly see all these vessels being lit up on the chest wall uh, and gives you an idea of uh, 
what exactly is happening. Uh, nowadays, with the softwares, you can do a 3D subtraction software on the uh, on the uh, same CCT that you've done. Uh, it's a more, slightly more extended study, and uh, you do delayed phases uh, where you want to look into the Veno, uh, venous phase and to see the, the dye moving into the collaterals. And then you do a 3D reconstruction on the console. The softwares are beautiful and you get excellent pictures of the collateralization of the SVC. So this is a tool that you must use a lot more. Uh, I don't know if you have access to this or not, but a good radiologist will be able to give you an excellent image of exactly where the obstruction is. The assessment uh, continues by using an MRI phlebovinography. So if you think that the obstruction is very acute, uh, is, uh, is subacute, not very acute. If it's very acute, you've got to go for stenting. If it is subacute and you still want to analyze what's happening in the vein, then MRI is a very good tool. MRI gives you good idea of the vascular involvement of the tumor and whether it is how much is the extent of the uh, involvement. Uh, and, and it gives you a good idea of uh, how much it is, uh, what is the, uh, the grading of the, of the mass in terms of the obstruction. Uh, of course, because you're dealing with malignancy, PET scan is a very good idea. Uh, all in grade one, two, and maybe in, three, in some cases of three, you, you will actually do the uh, biopsy first, which, which means you're trying to find out the cause of the, uh, of the obstruction. So you'll do a PET scan and then you'll follow it up with uh, a cranial CT or an MRI to see for the back pressure changes in the brain. And sometimes you also do a bone scintigraphy to see if there is anything else in the bones in cases of lymphomas and things like that. Uh, this is an MRI in geography, which clearly shows you beautiful delineation of all the blood vessels, shows you the collateralization, the IMA being uh, uh, distended, the collateral intercostals being distended, so it's a very, very good tool for looking for vascular involvement uh, in the chest. But of course, it takes a lo lot longer and the patient may not be able to lie still for 40 to 45 minutes for you to be able to do the MRI geography. Hence, CECT remains the gold standard in these uh, patients. Uh, again, now you're starting to look at what is the cause of the SVC Obstruction, so bronchoscopy with endobronchial biopsy, cytology, and BAL is, is indicated if the patient can tolerate a bronchoscopy, particularly in grade one and two. Uh, if there are mediastinal lymph nodes, then you need to biopsy these lymph nodes. You need a diagnosis, but please beware of doing it by mediastinoscopy. It is not a walk in the park to do mediastinoscopy with an SVC obstruction. I promise you this. The best thing is to get EUS or EBUS and biopsy it. You try to put an incision and try to get into the pretracheal space. Uh, the whole collateralization changes the vascularity of that area. And what is a relatively avascular operation? When you do a mediastinoscopy, you should actually have no bleeding whatsoever. But just the access to the tumor starts to bleed. And because there is back pressure changes, the bleeding does not stop, and you wonder whether you've actually damaged a major blood vessel. So it is, it is a nightmare when you're trying to do mediastinoscopy in somebody with SVC obstruction. So in the exam, if anybody ever asks you whether you should do mediastinoscopy, say no. Say I would do EBUS, EUS, or a ultrasound-guided biopsy or a CT-guided biopsy. But uh, mediastinoscopy is a real problem. In fact, many a times when they have not been able to get a diagnosis, and they want me to get a diagnosis, I have actually preferred to do a biopsy by VATS. So I can go in with VATS, have a look at the whole of the SVC, see the tumor and take a biopsy. There's so much space in the pleura and it's so much more safer because you will not cause that major bleeding that will happen when you go through a mediastinoscopy. So I personally, whenever I get a patient with SVCO who's had multiple biopsies, but they are unable to get a diagnosis, I am happy to go in with VATS and take a tissue biopsy rather than go in by mediastinoscopy. But you must do a good assessment to look at the peripheral lymph nodes uh, because if it's a lymphoma, the biopsy may be uh, amenable either in the femoral axillary or some other area. So you will be able to uh, save uh, 
getting into the media spinal. And of course, sputum cytology, pleural fluid cytology is present, but don't forget, send it for microbiology. You need to know if this is tuberculous lymphadenopathy. So it's quite important to have a good look at this patient uh, to find out the cause of the SVC obstruction, okay? So what is the principle of treatment of SVC obstruction? Always, always the first principle is to treat the underlying cause if the patient is not symptomatic from the SVC. It's only in grade four SVCO or grade three, four, and five in the, uh, in the clinical uh, uh, staging that you actually look for urgent venogram and stenting. If you are going to be uh, if you are going to be stenting or if there is thrombosis, then there is scope for treating it with anticoagulation. You can do it with a full systemic anticoagulation, and that will help you to get over the acute phase of the SCC obstruction. And then you have time to biopsy and do other things. The problem is the moment you have anticoagulated the patient, or you have stented and given anticoagulation, biopsy becomes a problem. And, and there is a risk of uh, or risk of bleeding of this patient. So once uh, you have got over this phase, then tissue biopsy and staging is the most important treatment for this. Uh, and then depending upon whatever is the staging or the type of the tumor, you, do, you treat it according to the tumor specific, stage specific uh, plan. So completely depends on what you find. So this is the guidelines that you should follow let me just uh, move this away. Uh, let's move this out somewhere. How do I hide this? Okay, let's keep it here. Take a screenshot of this. This is from the SVCO paper, uh, analysis paper. Very, very good guideline. This is the guideline. Okay, this is very nice one. Very, very uh, nicely written. So look at this. You do a clinical assessment, medical history, physical examination. Oh, come on. Who is doing this? So you do a clinical assessment, medical history, physical examination, chest radiography, and CECT. This we said is common with all of them. Uh, if it is a malignant SVC uh, syndrome, uh, then if you know, think that is the cause, look whether it is compromising or not. So you have to stage the SVC. If it is uh, compromising or uh, you're in grade four uh, symptoms, uh, which will happen about five times, uh, five percent of the time. You got to go in for urgent venogram and stenting. Very important. Or if there is throm uh, thrombosis of the SVC, which is causing the problem, then go for direct thrombolytic agents if the thrombus is present. Okay. So this is the pathway when the patient is compromised. If the patient is not compromised, if he's got grade one, two, or three symptoms, uh, then go in for tissue diagnosis, staging. Most importantly, you must have a multidisciplinary dis discussion because the moment the SVC has got involved, it means that tumor is, uh, is, is more than uh, just a simple early stage tumor. So you got to, be you got to have a multidisciplinary discussion. It's mandatory. Of course, if the neurological symptoms are present, uh, look for CNS back pressure changes, but more importantly, look for brain metastasis. That is very important, okay? And then depending on whether the tumor is resectable, you can go ahead and operate on the patient primarily, or if the tumor is chemosensitive or radiosensitive, like small cell lung cancer, lymphoma, or germ cell tumor, you will give the chemo radiotherapy, uh, depending on whatever is the uh, treatment. And then you'll continue the treatment without SVC, uh, uh, without SVC uh, intervention. Uh, what's happening you will continue the treatment without svc uh, intervention if the symptoms are a bit higher then you might have to consider stent and early radiation therapy so you might give some treatment and then if patient is still continuing to be symptomatic you might have to give early radiotherapy or consider stent for these patients of course it's a non small cell lung cancer the similar pathway depends on the symptoms of the patient. The bottom line is you can treat it either with primary surgery, you can treat it with chemotherapy, you can treat it with uh, stenting and early radiotherapy. There is role for radiotherapy and best supportive care. And the last but not the least is surgical bypass, okay? Uh, surgical bypass is not a frequently done operation these days. Only, uh, only when you get into a stage where the patient has been downstaged 
with previous chemo radiotherapy, uh, particularly in the case of thymoma, that is when you get involved with trying to resect the residual tumor along with an SVC resection. So SVC resection is not a common surgery, uh, at least these days, okay? So it's important to understand that. Uh, so let's look at the various treatments that are available and we'll go through them. Treatments are meant to alleviate symptoms. So you, you keep the patient head high. Uh, intramuscular and intravenous arm injections are to be avoided. You should not give anything in the upper limb, particularly if the back pressure is high. Uh, all uh, intravascular catheters that are present in the uh, body should be removed uh, as soon as possible, the moment you start getting thrombosis symptoms. And the patient must be put through systemic anticoagulation therapy. That's quite important to do. Uh, steroids are only used in steroid sensitive tumors and in certain other situations, we'll talk about it. Um, you also use steroids in, when you've given external beam radiotherapy to reduce the edema of the radiotherapy. Uh, and you can use diuretics to reduce the uh, preload of the patient. So you're trying to reduce the uh, uh, pressure on the heart. Uh, Palliation may be used, particularly when you're dealing with terminal cancer. And the palliation principle is just put in an SVC, make the patient symptom-free, and then give minimum therapy that is required. Irradiation used for palliation is usually a lower dose. Uh, yesterday, we said for mesothelioma, the dose goes down to 30. Uh, so you give a lower dose for palliation. Same uh, principle applies also for uh, anterior mediastinal tumors as well. Uh, and all you're trying to do is reduce the tumor mass so that the sim compressive symptoms are gone. You may also uh, use uh, chemotherapy as a primary treatment for the tumor. And the last is bypass surgery. And we'll talk about bypass surgery in more detail. I'll show you what we do. So what are the specialized therapies? Steroid treatment we spoke about. Uh, IV chemotherapy is uh, what we mentioned, uh, mega voltage external beam radiotherapy and insertion of an expandable metallic stand. The order may change depending upon the grade of the patient, okay? So that's important to remember. Let's look at the endovascular therapies that are happening. Um, so whenever you're trying to stand the SOC, you try to approach either through a femoral approach, which is more commonly done, or you can go via a jugular or a subclavian approach, okay? The jugular and subclavian approach gives you a more, uh, angulated approach. Uh, so the primary, most of the interventional radiologists try to go through a femoral approach. You, you, you use a nine French sheet to put it into the uh, vein. Uh, always give 5,000 international units uh, heparin intravenously. Uh, and the catheter that you use is a steerable hydrophilic terubo guide wire. So if you start with a steerable hydrophilic uh, guide wire catheter, which has got a very, very soft tip. So the soft tip allows you to manipulate uh, your guide wire through the obstruction. Usually these are tight obstructions, so you really need to be able to get through it. If you use a hard guide wire, you might actually cause a tear in the SVC. So you start off with a steerable uh, hydrophilic catheter, and then you move on to the uh, stiff guide wire, which is the Amplants, this P-L-A-N-T-Z, sorry for the spelling mistake. Uh, so you then you put in a stiff guide wire and then over the stiff guide, uh, guide wire, you take the catheter out uh, and then you put in a self-expanding stent. So this is a standard technique that is used uh, similar for uh, when they're doing a coronary uh, angioplasty and things like that, uh, Seldinger's technique. So the, the stent that is available, uh, that is used and has been studied is Sinus XX, which is a wall stent, or uh, Sinus XSL, or you can use a wall stent, which is another type of stent, or you can use a Gian Turco Z. Any of these stents uh, are available. They usually try to avoid a metallic stent, try to stick to the more of the uh, silicon and things like that, and nitinol stents. The important thing with stenting an SVC is you must always oversize it. You have to oversize it almost up to 10% so that the stent fits snugly against the SVC and does not migrate. That is the important thing. So you must oversize the stent. Uh, the, as I said, it's the oversized 10% to prevent migration. Uh, before you can put in the stent, uh, sometimes you might have to dilate the SVC uh, before the stent passes. And in fact, 
even after the stent has passed, you might actually have to dilate it with a balloon angioplasty. So you do push in the stent over your guide wire, but you might have to dilate it with a balloon angioplasty to get maximal opening of the SVC. Uh, if there is a short stenosis on the SVC, you can try the balloon expanding stent. Uh, this is called as the Palmer or the Strecken Strecker, Strecker stent. Uh, these uh, are available uh, freely in the market. Uh, sometimes you might do bilateral stenting. When we talk about bilateral stenting, we're talking about the SVC and the brachiocephalic. So uh, sometimes if the obstruction is coming proximally onto the left side, you might actually stent the brachiocephalic in addition to the SVC. But most of the times you actually just stent the SVC and you will get away with it. So unilateral stenting is usually adequate. Uh, and the important thing is if you've only stented the SVC, then the occlusion rate is lower and the recurrence rate is lower, reocclusion rate is lower. So the stent patency is longer with unilateral. And this has been studied in a couple of studies and this is the data that has come out of that. So if you can avoid it, preferably avoid a bilateral stenting. But of course, in some patients you have to do it. This is uh, how the stenting looks like. Uh, they're passed in a guide wire there, the guide wire goes in, then you push in a balloon over it, try and expand it. And then the stent is passed into it uh, over the, over the uh, guide wire. Once the stent goes into place, you can either deploy it and leave it in there, or you can deploy it and push in a balloon and re-expand the stent. So both of them are used uh, depending upon uh, what is the need of the patient and how well it responds to the, uh, to the problem. Of course, it depends on the type of the, uh, of the obstruction. So if you are dealing with a, with a soft tissue tumor, with a soft tumor, it might open up more easily than when you're dealing with mediastinal fibrosis. Mediastinal fibrosis is really, really difficult to open up the stand. Uh, so it is, it is uh, completely depend upon what is the pathology of the obstruction. Uh, this is another diagram showing you the obstruction. There's a tumor from outside. You've put in a guide wire. Uh, the balloon is in place and you've got the stent in and the stent is within the balloon and it's open, uh, is within the stent. The balloon is within the stent and it is opening up the stent to make the patient uh, asymptomatic. Uh, again, similar picture showing you different types of stents that we are using. Again, can you see the root is femoral and they're coming from down here rather than from up here so that they can get a straight longitudinal access into that head. Okay. What are the complications? There are pretty, uh, these are not uh, procedures without complications. You can get pericardial tamponade. Uh, you can get pulmonary embolism because the thrombus may shoot off. Uh, even worse is stent migration. Stent can fall into the RA or go across the tri tricuspid and get into the PA. So this is not uh, something that you have to take lightly. Uh, these stents require anticoagulation and sometimes anticoagulation gives problems like pulmonary, cerebral, or pericardial bleeding. So it is something that you got to keep in mind. Here is a, is somebody moving my slides or what is happening? I am really annoyed by this. Okay, so sometimes you can get pulmonary, cerebral, or pericardial bleeding, and that's a problem. This is a CT scan showing the Hemopericardium, can you see here clearly the hemopericardium that is happening secondary to SVC obstruction and stenting. So it is, uh, it is a known complication. And in fact, it might even cause uh, cardiac compromise and acute tamponade. So you've got to be careful when you're doing these procedures. They are not without their... Uh... What is that? Okay, this is a stent migration. This is a stent migration picture. You can see that the stent has fallen into the uh, RA. It is supposed to be here, but because it was not oversized, it fell into the RA. And that's not good for the patient because it then uh, causes uh, outflow obstruction for the patient uh, and uh, it has to be retrieved. They're actually now using a loop to retrieve that stent. Uh, you cannot redeploy the stent. Uh, usually you have to retrieve the stent and uh, start all over again. Uh, so that is uh, about endovascular stenting. What are the other treatment modalities available? 
external beam radiotherapy for uh, for svc obstruction was common before the stenting era the problem with external beam radiotherapy is it takes almost 5 to 10 days for the effects to be seen so even though the patient may come with an acute collapse the radiotherapy to comp uh, to uh, cause the tumor to die back takes 5 to 10 days as opposed to that the stenting is almost instantaneous so nowadays hardly anybody uses xdrt as a primary treatment of course if you are in a center where you don't have access to stenting or a good interventional radiologist or a cardiologist then you may use these techniques nowadays uh, radiotherapy can be used as a combination of chemo radiotherapy for treatment of the primary cancer uh it uh, there is evidence to show that it causes idiotypic effect which means the radiotherapy uh makes the receptor more sensitive to chemotherapy so radiotherapy acts on the uh, on the antibody receptor and it makes it more effective that's the word, meaning of the word idiotypic and so it makes uh chemotherapy act better on the on the tumor and shortens the overall treatment time and reduces the acceleration of tumor cell regrowth so chemo radiotherapy in anterior mediastinal tumor may work better uh, and you should preferably use it concurrent rather than sequential if you are going to be treating cancers in the mediastinum and you have to use chemotherapy it's better to use them concurrently of course the patient has to be fit to uh, withstand this uh, therapy uh, what about immunotherapy non hodgkins uh, is and germ cells chemotherapy is enough sclc radiation or chemotherapy alone are enough uh, but nowadays with the world moving into genomics and molecular analysis they have started looking at a combination of radiotherapy plus cetuximab uh, cetuximab uh, and there is some evidence now coming up uh, there are at least three or four papers which are saying that radiotherapy plus cetuximab may actually give you good results in patients with medius anterior mediastinal tumors with svc obstruction to the to the effect that these tumors may be downstaged and eventually be fit for surgery um and and they they work by this philosophy of overexpression of egfr receptors uh by the cetuximab cetuximab it it changes the receptor quality and then the receptor becomes radio sensitive so something that was not radio sensitive before becomes radio sensitive so it's it's a good uh, modality to be used steroids i told you are used in lymphomas and thymomas very often uh, if you are not in a situation to offer svc obstruction or uh, uh, svc stenting or uh, radiotherapy then give them steroids particularly when you are thinking of lymphoma and thymoma and and there is some regression of the tumor and that might be enough to actually relieve the symptoms of the patient and then uh, later on give uh, the full therapy that you need Uh, steroids are also used in post radiotherapy patients to reduce the swelling uh, because radiotherapy on one hand can reduce the uh, size of the tumor but on the other hand cause edema of the larynx and so symptoms may regress but respiratory symptoms may progress so it is it is really a catch 22 situation so steroids are used aggressively when you are giving uh, radiotherapy uh, particularly for laryngeal edema that's the one that you got to be careful Uh, so whether the edema is coming from svc obstruction or it's coming from the radiotherapy uh, you don't know but you have to use a high dose steroids to get control of the situation what about thrombolytics uh, local catheter directed thrombolysis is a known technique uh, increasingly being used particularly with the catheter related thrombosis uh, you can you have the option to do mechanical endovascular thrombectomy which means you go in via the uh, vascular route and use endovascular uh, forceps and endovascular scissors and endovascular uh, uh, something like a desjardins forcep and you grasp these uh, thrombi and take them out you can do a mechanical endovascular thrombectomy uh, but uh, there is uh, there is need for adjuvant thrombotic thrombolytic therapy after svc stents usually you need to give them anticoagulation for a long period uh, but you have to balance it against the risk of bleeding so at least for 3 to 6 months minimum but the problem is you got to remember there is another pathology which you have to treat so it's not just the svc obstruction is the other pathology that causes the problem and that is why you got to be careful about uh, balancing the risk benefits of giving anticoagulation 
So as I said, uh, three to six months is mandatory. Uh, beyond that, it completely depends on what is the response of the patient. Uh, endovascular and surgical, uh, what about surgery? Surgery has been replaced by endovascular techniques completely. Uh, almost hardly ever we do uh, surgical uh, interventions uh, in the, in the uh, current era. Uh, SVC surgery has gone down quite dramatically. The only place where SVC reconstruction still has a role is in locally invasive thymomas. In locally invasive thymomas, we give chemotherapy first, reduce the size of the tumor, and then go in and do thymoma resection plus minus SVC reconstruction. Occasionally in a smaller thymoma with SVC involvement, we would go in and do the S, uh, thymoma plus SVC recon, uh, resection first, and then do the reconstruction and then give chemotherapy as a follow-up uh, regime. So that, that it depends on an MDT discussion. Uh, of course, uh, in non-small cell lung cancer as well, there is a role for uh, surgery for the SVC. So there is a place for us to do SVC resection. Uh, so let's talk about SVC resections. Uh, there are many various techniques that are available for SVC resection. Uh, one is, of course, just uh, you know dissect out whatever you're doing, uh, take out the tumor along with a patch of the SVC with a vascular control, and then you primarily suture the SVC over it. I have personally done these even by VATS, uh, particularly when I'm doing uh, 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 tumors of the upper lobe, which are involving the mediastinum. Uh, I have gone in by VATS, done the lobectomy from below, uh, got rid of all the vessels, and then lifted up the tumor along with the attachment to the SVC, put in a vascular clamp below it, and then cut off the tumor, release the specimen, and then suture the SVC. Uh, but of course, you need to be, uh, you need expertise to be able to do something like this. Uh, most people traditionally would actually do this by an open thoracotomy technique. Uh, it doesn't matter whatever is your level of control, but you can do these uh, resections and safely take the uh, piece of SVC along with the tumor. Um, you can do an SVC to SVC anastomosis when you're doing a resection. Uh, you can do a left enominate to an SVC anastomosis, depending upon what you've done or you can do a right IJV to SVC anastomosis. So it completely depends on what is the level of resection that you have done. Sometimes you might have to go on bypass as well to, uh, to get uh, this situation in. So here you are, here we have done a SVC uh, resection. Uh, we have connected the right IJV to this and you can safely block off the left. You can tie off the left, just staple it off uh, because there is enough collateralization already happened uh, the patient will not be compromised with the back pressure. Uh, this is cancer surgery. So this didn't happen overnight. This was a slow growth over a period of time and the patient had enough time to collateralize. So you can safely just resect off the left side and connect the right uh, IJV to the SVC. That is possible. Uh, you can do uh, this sort. So you can clamp off the right and then connect the uh, SVC, stump of the SVC or the base of the RA to the left side, left brachiocephalic and you can put in a, a, a shunt uh, in the, across the mediastinum. The techniques to do SVC resection includes direct clamp and sew, uh, which I showed you earlier. You can clamp, clamp, cut, cut, and sew, uh, but you gotta be pretty quick uh, so that you don't have a long ischemia time. You can also go on cardiopulmonary bypass. The moment you go on cardiopulmonary bypass, you have a better uh, control of the vascular system and the hemodynamics and uh, particularly when you're going to be doing a more complex resection, it's better to go on bypass. The problem is when you're dealing with malignancy, uh, cardiopulmonary bypass in the presence of mal malignancy is not such a good idea because there is a risk uh, that your tumor cells uh, may be metastasized by the cardiopulmonary bypass. And the second problem is that to cardiopulmonary bypass, you need to heparinize these patients. And hep heparinizing these patients makes your surgery uh, much more complicated and the risk of bleeding is much higher. So you really got to think carefully and hard before you uh, try to get uh, cardiopulmonary bypass involved in uh, malignancy surgery. Uh, but of course you have to do it when you have to, when it's a very extensive resection. Most of the time when we do these sort of surgeries, very often we find that the phrenic may be involved. And if we do have to do that, then I personally do only one-sided phrenic resection. I will never do bilateral phrenic resection. And if I have to do a phrenic resection, uh, I will actually plicate the diaphragm on the table. 
uh, so that the patient does not end up with being on the ventilator or with compromise of the of the respiratory system. I personally never ever like to do a bilateral phrenic resection. I'll never ever do that because diaphragmatic pacing and things like that is a very complicated situation and the patient will never get off the ventilator. And there's no point in doing such a extensive heroic surgery and then having a patient stuck in the ICU, uh, not able to get off the uh, ventilator. As I said, I will do the plication of diaphragm if I've done unilateral uh, phrenic resection along with the tumor. Uh, what about autologous vein? You can use autologous vein. You can use bovine pericardium. You can use arterial homographs. Completely depends on your setup. Wherever you're working, whatever you have got, uh, the SVC is, is very, very forgiving. And you can actually use any of these uh, any of these. Uh, uh, prosthesis for getting uh, a reconstruction of the SVC. Uh, so you can, you know, use bovine pericardium, you can use uh, whatever is available to you at that moment. There's a lot of things in, in uh, literature where different surgeons have used different uh, prosthetic material and reconstructed the SVC. Uh, so, you know, there is, there is very little data available around in the world because not many have done uh, huge numbers of these cases. And particularly now uh, with newer chemotherapies, newer radiotherapy regimes and better endovascular techniques, uh, more and more the SVC resection is going in the bin. Uh, here, here you can see that even though uh, we have done such extensive resections, there is still some evidence of uh, survival at five years. So it is worthwhile considering these patients for surgery. Uh, what are the outcomes? It depends on the etiology. Outcome completely depends on etiology. Uh, chemo and, and or radiotherapy relieves the SVCO in 77% of patients. So many a times you might not even need to stand the SVC, just giving chemo and or radiotherapy will, re will relieve the obstruction. 17% uh, of them have recurrent SVCS. Uh, this is uh, directly from a meta-analysis data of all the published studies. Uh, Non-small cell lung cancer, 60% uh, will get relieved if you give them chemo radiotherapy. Uh, SVC stenting works in 95% of people. Very, very, very good outcome. Very good outcome, particularly when the patient is acutely compromised. And long-term as well, patency is maintained at 92%. So it's a very good technique and should be used uh, if you've got a patient. Uh, but the problem, of course, is if the patient has been given pre-operative, pre-therapy thrombolytics. If they've been given pre-therapy thrombolytics, it really, really becomes uh, difficult to do these procedures and morbidity does go up. And that is what the literature states. So coming back to this, it's very important. This is the one that you need to uh, write in an exam. Whoever is exam going, please take a snapshot of the screen. I'll keep this on for a few seconds. Please take a snapshot. And if you want, I am very happy to share this paper with you. Uh, take a snapshot of this paper. This is the one you have to read. And this will give you everything that you need in an SVCO. You, this will come as a theory question in DNB. Uh, I don't know how many marks, but it will come as a theory question. Uh, usually SVCO comes as a clinical case uh, in the FRCS exam when you're dealing with chronic obstruction not with acute obstruction, okay? Acute obstruction will never come. So the, because the signs are so classical that we usually try to keep a case like this in the, in the exams. So to summarize, clinical features are striking but rarely require emergency intervention. Uh, the commonest cause is malignancy. Tissue biopsy is important to find out what malignancy it is. MDT approach is quite important. Uh, uh, hemodynamics, compromise can happen, laryngeal edema, all of this is emergency situation. Uh, severe symptoms, endovascular stenting, the level of evidence at the moment is 1B. So first treatment that you must give in severe symptoms is endovascular stenting. And you can safely say the level of evidence is 1B. So there is more and more evidence coming out. XBRT is not common nowadays, nobody's using it. Uh, radiotherapy and steroids following radiotherapy to prevent edema for SVCO is getting uh, some literature out there. So level of evidence is 2C, okay? So use of radiotherapy with steroids to prevent edema, but usually in the early stages, not in the 
uh, very acute stages. In, in chronic uh, SVC obstruction, you can use radiotherapy. Uh, in cancer settings, you, you can stent the patient first, then give concurrent chemo radiotherapy, uh, and that also is known to prevent tumor regrowth in the SVC. So concurrent radiotherapy, uh, stenting followed by concurrent radiotherapy uh, is one of the treatment modalities for, uh, for uh, SVC obstruction secondary to malignancy. Uh, Non-Hodgkin's lymphomas or germ cell tumors respond beautifully to chemotherapy, okay? So you must look at chemotherapy as a first option, uh, first option when you have SVCO secondary to these diseases. Small cell or non-small uh, carcinomas can get chemo radiotherapy 1C because this uh, this is an advanced disease. You can give chemo radiotherapy and you will get very good response with these disease and the SVCO will uh, go away. Again, the level of evidence is 1C. Okay, so if you have a case with non-small cell you can say, I will use chemo radiotherapy. That's not a problem. Endovascular stents are being increasingly popular, uh, but the need for long-term anticoagulation is an issue with them. And that is something that's still being discussed. Hence, uh, the evidence is not yet very clear whether you need to give them lifelong anticoagulation or not. Uh, but it is an issue. We don't know what is the correct answer for that. Uh, but in, in, if you want to avoid that, then dual platelet inhibition for three months, uh, use of aspirin and clopidogrel is the recommendation now uh, that has come out of literature. So dual platelet inhibition is what you have to say in the exam. Uh, RCTs uh, for most recommendations are lacking. Uh, we are making recommendations now on the basis of case series and uh, expert opinion. So there are very few people who have huge volumes of uh, studies which are telling us uh, what is the outcome for these patients. Thank you very much. Quite a straightforward technique, but it is definitely worth knowing because you will get a question in the FRCS uh, asking you about this. Okay, all right. So anybody wants to ask me any questions? Simple topic, but definitely worth knowing. And a few points which I brought out are from the literature. Thank you guys, come on, questions. Hi, this is Dr. Avijit here. Hi, Dr. Abhijit. Uh, any specific indications where uh, you would like to take patients to operation theater directly instead of even thinking about taking them to cath lab to put stent or anything? Not nowadays. <laughs> Not nowadays. Because we had three situations where we had to, in fact, take up this patient for emergency sternotomy in lateral positions. Patient presented wow. with cerebral edema and also with severe strider, which was not getting relieved even with intubation. We were able to pass in a reinforced, wire reinforced tube, but in supine position, patient was not able to maintain. So we had to do a phlebotomy and take a patient for an emergency sternotomy in lateral position. I mean, especially in a place where you really do not have the luxury of cath lab, even if you have cath lab, people who are actually good enough to, you know, kind of take up patients who are having sure. severe strider and able to do stenting. Yeah, but, but that is not a shortfall of the technique. It's a shortfall of expertise. Yeah, right. So, you know, that will happen no matter where you are. A shortfall of expertise, these are all uh, difficult okay. situations. And, and these guys come in acutely unwell. So you have to do whatever it takes to save the patient. Uh, I personally, fortunately, work in centers where I yeah. had good support. But if I was in a center where there was nothing else available and the patient is dying in front of me, I would open the chest. I agree with you. But that's very, very rare. I have touch would not been in that situation. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. But but good point you've made. Yeah. You know, particularly because we have a lot of people from countries where all these fancy equipments may not be available. And so we yes. need to know what else to do in that situation. Okay. Next question, please. Uh, hi. Hi, is uh, that, yes. Yes, uh, is it? Dr. Yashwan there. Okay, so Hi, uh, basically, I just want to ask two questions. This is regarding SVC, uh, chronic SVC thrombosis. So mm -hmm. as you said, in all these chronic patients, innominate can be uh, uh, kind of ligated. So what mm -hmm. is the proximal extent of IJV, which we can safely anastomose? I mean, is, do you take any level which is safe? Uh, and second question is, uh, these patients, they present with a lot of collaterals. 
and suppose they become symptomatic with these collaterals they have some epigastric pain or they develop some periesophageal paralysis uh, would you recommend surgery or uh, should we still you know continue with some conservative kind of management if they are otherwise asymptomatic besides this pain okay so let's talk about your first question uh, the anastomosis should be done as distal as possible rather than as proximal as possible uh, so which means that you try to come as close to the heart as possible okay you there is no guideline which says you can uh, there is a cut off for what is the level that you can go uh, yeah, but you you try to maintain the subclavian and the igv uh, uh, point uh, but sometimes if you if you have to go beyond that then you place a, a subclavian graft as well uh, i know of at least one situation where we had to place in a subclavian graft in addition to svc and igv but the more complex reconstruction that you do the more are the chances of uh, failure uh, and thrombosis and thrombolysis uh, thrombosis happening in these uh, grafts so there is no cut off that has been mentioned uh, so we we have cut off the left side and blocked it off and done just the right side we have only done svc to svc we have put in an interposition graft i i have been involved in one case where we did the subclavian but i i personally don't like it i don't think uh, that gives you good outcomes in the long term uh, with these patients uh, bottom line is it's not about the svc or the ig the bottom line is zero resection because no matter what you do when you go into these situations you always go in with an idea of r zero resection so you have to do whatever it takes to get the tumor out debulking is not a good surgery and it's very unfortunate that in india many times i get uh, this uh, discussion happening where people say i will go ahead and debulk the tumor that is not a good oncological principle if you are going to operate you must always go in with an idea of r zero resection but of course within the limits of uh, you know having a live patient come out on the other side so that is why you cannot say what is the level of resection that you can do uh, of the svc i never know how much of svc i need to take out when i go in it's always on table when you see i'm looking at the tumor i'm not looking at the svc you understand that so i really need to make sure that uh, the svc is uh, the tumor is out rather than the svc because reconstruction can be done so that's Why? number 1 number 2 uh, what was your second question in symptomatic uh, collateral yeah basically yeah collateral is causing yeah nowadays in this uh, day and age uh, be- because of interventional radiology being available any symptomatic uh, collateral can be dealt with Uh, no matter what problem they are causing you can always uh, go in and embolize them so uh, managing the collateral is not so much of a problem the problem is managing the primary pathology and uh, it completely depends on the histology of the pathology now if you go in and operate and it turns out to be lymphoma you have done no favor to this patient because there is no role for surgery in lymphoma so in answer to your question the bottom line is it completely depends on the histology of the of the problem and most of the times you might actually end up giving chemotherapy or chemo radiotherapy and then operating i have personally not been in a situation where i've got to crash into the chest and uh, take out the tumor uh, never a good idea i always believe that uh, uh, and emergency surgery in the anterior mediastinum Uh, is is not good it doesn't give you good results no matter how experienced you are it never gives you more re- good results so you have to try and optimize your surgical skills by using the other technologies available to you does that make sense yes yeah yeah absolutely the only thing with what i was trying to ask you was like if the patient is having epigastric pain it's very difficult to find out which collateral actually is you know giving rise to this pain it's periapatic one or some other one so i mean that is one point secondly when i was talking about so the igv thrombosis pain is your only issue yes if pain is your only issue i would not operate on the patient to take away the obstruction because pain is a very very random thing it is very difficult to localize the pain i am mm-hmm. talking about you know i'm talking about hematemesis massive bleeding things like that or huge uh, 
uh, subcutaneous, uh, you know, uh, hematomas and things like that. That is what I was talking about. Pain and is something you you never know where the pain is coming from. I would not embolize something for pain for sure. I would give okay. him other therapies for pain. Fair enough. Uh, the other thing which I was asking was this: IJV thrombus. Suppose it is going right up to the base of the skull. Will you still intervene? If... <laughs> Probably not. I would say my prayer and go home. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would. Yes, I would not. Yes. I want an alive patient. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. That is certainly beyond the scope of my expertise for sure. So I would not operate on somebody like that. If I may ask just one more question, but, who but is doing the important the... thing is the important thing is you can actually anticoagulate these patients nowadays, and with good anticoagulation, these thrombus may dissolve. So that's the other thing. You have options available to you. One last question: Who is doing all these interventions? The cardiologist or the uh, cardiac surgeons? Uh, the interventions depends on what center you work in. Uh, we have. Um, Uh, it, I, I work in four or five different centers, and every center does it differently. Uh, the cardiac surgeons are frequently involved in the surgical side of things, uh, but when it is endovascular, in fact, I have had a radiologist who does really great endovascular work, and I've also had a cardiologist who does very great endovascular work. And so I will offer it to the cardiologist or the uh, uh, interventional radiologist. It completely depends on your center, whoever is you know. I don't know too many uh, cardiac surgeons who are doing great endovascular surgery at the moment. So it is it is dependent on on center to center. Lot of vascular. But I I surgeons. think we have done a huge disfavor by letting go of endovascular work. I really think. Uh, You know, I think the the mistake started when we were so focused on doing CABGs that we thought that you know we don't need to learn how to do a basic uh, coronary angiogram. That is where the first mistake happened, and I think you know not just my generation but the generation before me probably made that huge mistake of letting the interventional cardiology take over all of the angiography and the endovascular work. I think it's a huge problem. so on the thoracic side i do not let any end intervention or endo endobronchial work go directly to the pulmonologist i am always involved we have a hybrid theater i want to be there i want to do everything with the pulmonologist even if they want to do it i'll stay with them so that my trainees learn all these techniques because tomorrow the pulmonologist will take over and then you are left with nothing so i think we have made a huge mistake as a as as a community as cardiac surgeons because not i i think 95% of cardiac surgeons wouldn't know how to do a coronary angiogram that is the reality and we've been discussing this in the academic council of iax again and again and i think it is time that we learn how to do simple angiograms and then you know i mean what is so difficult about doing a stent for god's sake <laughs> so maybe it's time okay. to reclaim what we lost Uh, we have to reclaim, but it's it might be a bit too late now because the other guys have gone way ahead. That's the problem. So okay, Thank let's you, let's stick to the topic. Thank you very much, Yash. Next question, please. Sir, good evening. Hi, Vivek. How are you? Hi, good evening, sir. Thank you very much for the wonderful lecture. Hi, good evening. Thank you. Uh, sir, I had uh, one uh, uh, doubt. Actually, uh, sir, um, since we are giving anticoagulation to these patients, um, mm-hmm. what is the role for um, uh, you know uh, coag- uh, you know uh, checking on a coagulation profile? And if so, what would the ta- target PTINR be? Uh, usually, uh, if you're looking at the INR, you've got to be at least twice the recommended limit. So you know you look for two to two point five, but you really don't. it's not like valve surgery but still you have a risk of uh, having a a thrombo- thrombolysis a uh, little risk of a thrombus forming if you haven't adequately anticoagulated the patient but the balance is between doing the therapeutic uh, part of the surgery versus the anticoagulation because you're anticoagulating for the svc that's great but really the problem is outside the svc there's a tumor sitting in the medial sinum So you really need to balance it out and so you know most of uh, you, very often when you are doing treatment you you can't even do a needle biopsy when the inr is too you know you can't even do a needle biopsy to to establish whether this is uh, non small lung cancer or small cell lung cancer so sometimes you have to downgrade the anticoagulation purely to allow the uh, diagnostics and the therapeutic uh, modalities to take place
but usually twice the normal limit is what we go for thank you sir okay thanks sir vikas any other yes, questions sir. yeah vikas, vikas tell me how do you manage it one minute because be before you ask me the question i just want to sort of off offer to you guys i have a little small topic uh, which is video editing for surgeons okay yes sir so yes, if sir. you if you think that we have got time and you want to hear about it i'm very happy to just talk a little bit about video editing it is just something sir. different from Definitely, sir. if you if you guys are not tired from having no no not at all sir. too many uh, lectures we are But tired of sleeping all day <laughs> okay so come on uh, so that's why yes, I, i kept the second topic very light and uh, yes, you know non academic so that you, yes, you you'll enjoy it. so yes yes because ask me the question so oh, how do we manage if the stent has got thrombosis it's restenting or surgery <laughs> anticoagulation <laughs> Anti systemic really. anticoagulation and lot of prayers and prasad prasad yes <laughs> okay very difficult situation my friend this patient no, has already surgery. got definitely not surgery no 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 i would not operate certainly i would not operate because you got to remember it's not about the svc obstruction it's not the fact that he got svc obstruction because of disease which has infiltrated into the svc these are yes. not guys who are going to live 10 years may i just say to get involved with that situation may i just Honestly, give a comment not... please do who is that yeah th this is abhijit here see Hi, uh, in a, in, a, in a surgical options what we are thinking is bypass but the occlusion rate in venous bypass is extremely high to the extent Absolutely of 70 right. to 80% within 6 months yeah. i mean same thing even with stent the occlusion yeah. rate in venous stenting is very very high yeah absolutely right so really whenever we do bypass we are not doing bypass to relieve svc obstruction we are doing bypass to relieve cancer that is what you got to remember yes yes the yes. philosophy is different the philosophy is i want to the same answer as i gave to the previous question about the extent of the venous resection my philosophy when i go in is not to relieve svc obstruction my philosophy is to take away the cancer that is the reason why i will operate i will never operate now in the current era i will never operate to relieve svc obstruction almost never okay all right yes, any sir. more questions guys go ahead quickly no sir no so more questions everybody is happy sir just Do we have time sir just one Sorry, little one. thing yeah 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 andre come in hey good uh, to sir, see your face it's, it's well lit up <laughs> so today for a change yeah yes, tell sir. me so the uh, preferred agent for anti uh, coagulation because uh, uh, it clearly says uh, in recommendations that until or unless it's a post mitral valve replacement patient or a patient who uh, does, does not have mitral valve disease uh, the agent should be one of those uh, direct thrombin inhibitors like uh, vigabatran dabigatran and uh, um you know those couple of fancy things other two um, i i am not a cardiologist the only two i know about is aspirin and clopidogrel yeah. <laughs> i would take cardiology okay. advice on whatever is the latest uh, anticoagulation but uh, the papers at the moment are talking about aspirin and clopidogrel the new newer ones the uh, i don't i can't even pronounce that name but uh, they they are started being using them in the in uk in london uh, but uh, still we are old timers i am happy with that but if the cardiologist advises me otherwise i'll go with whatever they advise me. right okay okay sir we like the background sir we like the background very much sir very different thoracic views huh <laughs> see you got to have increasing pain my friend okay. yes all right okay uh, so let us do a little different topic is that okay with everybody or is it too much please go ahead very sir. short okay not, not very long but just to give you an, a taster of what you need to know when you're talking about uh, you know we are all talking about vats and things like that but do we really understand the technology that's the question okay so let's see a few things that uh, of technology i just bought it out uh, from my is this is uh, this is not really an academic one it's a non academic talk but still helpful if you want to learn about vats and things like that obviously you can see this is a talk i had done a long time ago so let's forget this forget this okay 
So we get repeatedly told, told that thoracic surgery is a poor man's disease, okay? Yeah, Vikas, you always think this, don't you? And cardiac surgeon is all very posh. Eh? These were my children when they were young. <laughs> so, so we have a problem with everybody saying thoracic surgery is like this, while all you cardiac surgeons are running around in Lamborghinis and things like that. So that, that is changing. That is changing quite rapidly. Uh, we have gone into the world of minimally invasive surgery and a lot of cardiac surgeons now want to learn thoracic surgery because uh, the cardiologists are taking over your issues, okay? But the problem is doing all these complex surgeries and doing all these high-end surgeries, you really have so much equipment in the theater that I bet you 90 to 95% of surgeons who actually operate by VATS have never seen the back of this trolley. And, and you really need to know the back of the trolley because when something goes wrong, you need to know how to troubleshoot. And that is why this lecture has been put together, just to give you an idea of what are the technicalities involved in this trolley and how to record the video and how to edit a video. Because at the end of the day, uh, really videos are what sells you as, as an entity nowadays. So let's look at the optics of, of, of VATS and robotics first. So we all know it's very simple. There's zero degrees, 30 degrees, 45 degrees. And then uh, there is the new chameleon, endochameleon, which can swing from zero to 120 degrees. So these are the basic uh, cameras that are available, telescopes that are available to you for doing the surgery. Uh, you can have 10 mm, 5 mm, 4 mm, 3 mm. Uh, they are really going down in size quite rapidly. And that's not, uh, that's, that's good. But the important thing to remember is the lesser the diameter, the more likely you are to damage it. Because the abdomen is different. Abdomen is soft, but the chest has got two ribs, one above, one below. And the moment you manipulate your instrument, you will bend it on the rib. So you've got to be very, very careful when you're using these complex uh, instruments. So that's a normal, this is a 30 degrees, that's an endochameleon. I personally really hate the endochameleon because my camera is being held by my assistant. And if he doesn't like me, he quietly changes the 30 to 45 and I'm in trouble. I don't know what the hell the view is because my hand-eye coordination is based on 30 degrees. So inadvertently, very often this gets changed uh, from zero to 30 to 45 and the whole surgery becomes a mess. So I don't like to use an endochameleon. That's my personal choice, okay? So, come on, what's up here? Okay, whenever you do surgery, whenever you're setting up a VATS program, this is for you, Amol. If you are going to set up a VATS program and if you have to buy equipment within a limited budget, the first thing you have to make sure is that the camera is HD. In this day and age, if you want to do VATS, then the image is everything. The quality of your surgery is directly correlated to the image. So make sure your camera is HD. And the second important thing is make sure your camera is three chip. Now, what does it mean? What does three chip mean? Three chip means, in the, a single chip means that the uh, RBG, the color RBG, red, blue, and green, all three are processed by a single chip. Whereas when you get into three chips, there are three different chips on the, in the system and the red comes into one chip, the blue comes into one chip and the green comes into another chip. And so when you get the output, you get more than a million combinations of red, blue and green. Hence the quality of the vision improves dramatically. That is why within, as you do with buying a computer, if you've got a certain budget, always try to get the highest number within the budget and look for HD and look for three chip. Nowadays, single chip cameras have no rule whatsoever. So you should never be buying a, a, a single chip camera. So now when you're using your technology, there are zoom. A lot of people don't understand what is a zoom. So there are two types of zooms available. One is a digital zoom and one is an optical zoom. What the digital Digital zoom does is it takes part of the picture and it increases the size of the picture. So this image, this little bit will be processed by the computer and it will increase in size. So you feel that you're looking at it closely. 
but actually all you're doing is you're manipulating the pixelation of that image. And hence, with a digital zoom, the image, the higher you go, is more pixelated than a normal picture. As opposed to that, an optical zoom actually uses optics to improve the concentration of an area, which means that you see the resolution much better with an optical zoom than with a digital zoom. So never buy a camera which has got 100x digital zoom. That's no good. That is purely a, a computer software which is doing that. What you really want to buy, any camera that you buy, you must look for optical zoom. What is the optical zoom of this camera? Okay, so it's quite important to understand the difference between the two. You go with the higher number, but not for digital zoom, but for optical zoom, okay? So this is a true zoom, uses lens for the optics, and the image is always sharper. And mind you, nowadays, because we are doing so much processing, and particularly when you take that image into a software and you sit down to edit the image, the sharpness of the image really matters. And uh, I'll tell you the number of times where I've sat down to edit and I found that it looked great on my phone, but the moment it came onto my 28-inch uh, screen on which I'm doing my video editing, it's completely useless, okay? So never use digital zoom. Digital zoom is only an in-camera image processing. It enlarges the image at the center, prints the outside, but there is serious loss of resolution and there is what is called as pixelation. That is not such a good idea, okay? All right. So this is a processor. So you, you have seen what the uh, telescope is. We've seen what the camera is. Now this is a processor. This is a Carl Storz endoscopy processor. Uh, you have to use a processor, but always the processor has to be HD. 1020 is the min 1080 is the minimum nowadays that you must use. Now I'll try to explain to you those lines in a minute. There is the light source. This is a xenon light source, but this is fast going out of uh, uh, out of fashion. Really, the LED light sources are coming in. This is a hot light source. As opposed to this, LED is a cold light source. And LED has more than 50,000 hours of use. This has only two, two to 3,000 hours of use per bulb. So it is important to move into the LED light source, not into the xenon light source. This is the one that you must uh, get. And these are becoming increasingly cheaper. So if you're going to get anything, get an LED light source. Now, the important thing is that you can drive a Mercedes. It doesn't matter. But if your tires are not the best, the Mercedes is no good. Many, many, many times I've seen people using a high definition uh, telescope, a high definition camera, a high definition connection, but the monitor is just a normal definition monitor. So you must, must use a high definition monitor. It should be a wide view monitor and you, you must get the highest, only then will the image be represented from your camera. If your monitor is not HD, it's really useless trying to use a HD, uh, HD camera, okay? Uh, we've got 3D endoscopes available. I won't talk about that at the moment. Uh, let me just go beyond this. This is not what I want to talk about. Let's go here, okay? So this is how I do VATS. I, I do either in the lateral, supine or prone position. Uh, my standard position, these are my philosophies for doing a, a VATS surgery. Uh, again, this is not the talk, so let me just go beyond this. Let me come to the instrumentation, okay? I'm going to go beyond. So whenever you're going to do a VATS, it's absolutely important to get the instruments right. These are laparoscopic instruments. They are all right angled, not a good idea. I personally don't like right angled because they work well on the abdomen, but they don't work well on the chest. So I personally use normal thoracic instruments, except that they are slightly longer, okay? So these are my standard instruments and I won't talk about this at the moment. I want to get to the important one. Okay, so what are the techniques to learn VATS? The important thing in optics is that anything that you do, you must record. It's absolutely mandatory to record all procedures, no matter what. And more important than recording the procedure is to sit in the evening and edit your videos. It is absolutely mandatory because you will realize the number of things that you learn on the editing table is 10 times more 
what you will learn on the operating table and it is mandatory i cannot stress this enough okay make sure that whenever you are recording a video you must take a patient's consent because uh, audio visual put out onto the internet with a patient's face visible is not okay all right confidentiality has to be maintained you must not have any markers which identify the patient all recordings should be in the highest resolution i promise you the number of times i've seen people recording you know using a hd camera using hd connections using hd monitors but the recording setting is uh, standard definition they don't even realize it it's very very important to set your recordings onto the highest resolution that your recording device allows okay very 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 important okay uh make sure that whenever you finish your recording your master copy is important your master copy should be saved and locked you have to lock your master copy which means that no matter what it is it is put into another hard disk any time that you are doing editing you always do editing with a copy of the master copy because lose a master copy there is no going back and i promise you over the years of editing and recording the number of times where i have forgotten to lock the master copy and accidentally deleted it is unimaginable so always 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 so on my desk i i, I wish you could see my desk i have got a 4 terabyte hard disk i've got a at least 3 2 terabyte hard disk and i've got a vertical rack with up at least about 10 terabytes on it so individual hard disk so all my recordings the moment i finish it it gets saved into the uh, into offline uh, recording so i never save it on my computer my computer is completely blank anybody locks into anybody uh, attacks my computer he will never get anything off my computer everything is pushed into a back end and the back end is where all the recordings are saved and locked very very important it's a small tip but i promise you if you lose a recording of a good case or a complication it is lost forever and it is very 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 frustrating when you do that okay now video editing when you're going to edit a video it doesn't start with the when you sit on the table to edit it starts with the operating theater it starts with the capture the capture is important the uploading of the capture into the software is important you have to understand each one of these processes you have to understand what is a editing software what can it do for you what what are the various tools of the editing software and then once you finish editing that's not the end of it actually it takes even longer to render the video sometimes i might spend you know 4 hours in my operation to capture the video and because it is a very high resolution video i spend a couple of hours to upload the video into my software and then sometimes i might spend 3 to 4 hours to edit the video i do nowadays because i have done a lot of it i do a different style of editing my first edit is done by a professional guy who reduces the 3 hours to uh, 20 minutes and i do the second and the third edit the second edit and the third edit is when you reduce a 20 hour to 7 minutes or 3 minutes depending upon what is the requirement of the paper or the of the or the conference this really takes a lot more experience the second and the third edit takes you more time than the first edit so from a 3 hour to 20 minutes is very easy to do but from 20 minutes to 3 minutes is really takes experience to do it and many 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 at times my rendering happens overnight so i i you know initially when the so uh, computers were not uh, very uh, sort of lot of um, memories and all that i would end up putting the thing on rendering go to sleep and next morning get up and find that the video had rendered nowadays you can use a capture card and you can use a video card and you can render as you go particularly because i use mac softwares most of my rendering nowadays happens as i am editing so i render as i am going along and after you have rendered you got to save it as a separate file so many people don't understand that after rendering the file format that comes out <coughs> may not be the one that the website takes 
So it might be dot .avi. Dot .avi is a very heavy file. A dot .avi cannot be sent to a YouTube video. So you really need to know what is the file format that goes to the video. So it's important to understand what it takes to upload the file. Okay, so let's look at capture. Always capture in highest definition. HD is mandatory. Now you have to understand what do you mean by HD? Okay, in the old days when we started off, it was more than 480 horizontal lines. And in the US, uh, it was, in the Europe, it was more than 576 horizontal lines. Okay, that was standard definition when we started off in those days. But then with time, the revolution, uh, the, the resolution started improving. From normal television, we went to a, somebody's uh, thing is on. Just switch off your microphone. Switch off your microphone, Kesava. Switch off your microphone. Once uh, the standard definition went away, we went to 720p. What does 720p mean? 720p means there are 1280 horizontal, uh, uh, 720 horizontal lines and 1280 vertical lines. That is the meaning of this by this. And progressive is a technology of the screen that it records in. So each image is overlaid onto the next image so that there is a progressive, there is no lag in the image. But most of us nowadays use 180i, okay, 1080. This is a standard high definition. My MacBook screen is 1080i, but now with the Retina display, it is much higher. It's 2400i. Uh, uh, so it is important to know what this 10 is. So 1080 means 1920 horizontal lines and 1080 vertical lines. But the technology now is interlaced. The progressive is gone. You actually need to use 1080i. Interlaced means the next image is interlaced with the first image. So everything that moves, you get it as a sequential uh, thing and there is no lag within the image. So anything that you record, the minimum recording should be 1080. You cannot these days record in 720 or 435, okay? So you can use 1080i or 1080p. Both are available on the market. Uh, the newer resolutions are available, which is 1440p, which is, again, look at the numbers. The numbers are progressive. So this is an exponential increase. This is not a arithmetic increase. It's not one becoming two, becoming uh, uh, three. It becomes one becoming two, becoming four, becoming uh, 16, becoming 64. Do you understand? So it's a progressive increase. So higher this number, much higher is the resolution. The million cap, uh, the number of pixels is much, much higher. And, and what you see on the screen is much higher. And nowadays the latest televisions, forget uh, theater, uh, forget uh, operating theater screens, the televisions are available in 8K. Okay, I just saw recently a Sony television in 4320p. So if you're working in 4320p, can you imagine the quality of resolution? The problem is if you don't capture it in high resolution, then your editing is only as good as what you have captured. And remember, this video is going to last you for many, many years. So when you go back and see your old video, you feel so sad because the quality of capture is the problem. So if you have a certain amount to spend, always buy the highest number. Nowadays, 4K, most of my devices on my desk at the moment are all 4K compatible. So I work in this domain at the moment. But of course, when I started off, I started in 720. I didn't start with 475, 480. I never worked with 480. The, I started with 720, then I went into 1080, but now I'm in 2160 capability. And this is what you have to capture. All cameras have also become 4K. So it's very important to understand what is the capture method that you're using. Now you can have a very good uh, camera, but if your connectors are not correct, they are not HD, your image will never be HD. A lot of people make this mistake. They use those cables, which are S SD, standard definition cables. HD cables are different cables. They have a different weight of carrying that HD signal. So cable connectors that are available are composite, component, and HDMI. Okay, it's very important to understand the three separate cables that are available. So this is a composite. This was in the old days where we used to use it. A yellow for video, white for uh, right, left audio, and R for right audio. This, still a few old devices 
have them, but now we have almost given up on this. Uh, the RCA or the BNC connectors, this is a BNC connector. A lot of the uh, things in theater will have BNC connectors. Uh, your devices in theater will have BNC connectors. Uh, uh, some theaters have an RCA jacket. Uh, the good thing about RCA jacket is you've got RGB, re red, blue, and green. So separate signals are being carried by separate cables. So the chip that is reading at the other end uh, on the computer is also picking up separate colors. These are not so good. So the composite is not so good because they all get mixed into one signal and it goes. So even though your camera may be HD, your connector may not be HD. So BNC is not such a great thing. If at all you have to use, you must use RCA, but even better than all of this is a uh, HDMI. I personally use HDMI because HDMI has two methods of carrying. One, it carries the sound signal through one chain, one cable, and it carries the video signal through a red, green, and blue. So everything is separated out and everything goes as a component to the uh, computer eventually. Is it making sense, guys? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. Or is it getting too much? Yes, yes. I, I'm just no, trying sir. to explain to you very simple stuff. No. At the back, you've got VGA, you've got DVI and HDMI. If you have to work, you have to work within the DVI and HDMI zone. VGA is no longer acceptable, no longer. 720p, 720p is all that VGA can carry, maximum. Whereas a DVI and HDMI can carry 180p. In fact, HDMI can carry 1080, but now we have 4K HDMI available. So remember the cable that you buy is very important. It has got to be at least 4K compatible. So if you buy a 4K TV, and everything else is just simple HDMI, it's no good. Your wires also have to be 4K HDMI, okay? So it's important to understand that. Now you've understood what is at the back. Now let us look at recording devices. So there is a whole range of recording devices available in the market depending upon what is your budget. So if you've got low budgets, then you buy a DVD recorder, almost obsolete nowadays, nobody uses DVD recorders. Uh, you've got handheld recording devices, uh, something like the Arcos. Uh, Arcos is now with AV800, I think, or 900. And this is good enough. Uh, but again, you might probably get uh, SD uh, quality recording into this. Uh, so I personally don't use uh, these. You can use an HD or an HDD. HD is uh, hard disk, and this is a hard disk drive. Uh, so HD is high definition. And this is a hard disk drive. So what you have to use is HD, HDD combined, which means there is a hard drive within this drive. So I can, I have a recording device where I can take out the, 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 uh, the uh, motherboard and I can replace it with more memory. So I can take out one terabyte when it's full and I can put in another terabyte or two terabytes, whatever you like. So, but it depends on your budget. So whatever is your budget, you can use, you can buy. The best is of course, what is available from stores because this does really high, high definition recordings. Uh, but again, you have to know how to set the recordings to the highest possible levels. So in our robotic theater, we use very, very high uh, definitions because the robotic device allows us to do that, okay? So remember to get a good recording device. So we have done camera, we have done the wires, we have done the, uh, the processor, we have done the connector, we have done the cable. Now you've got your capture device and you've got your video and now you sit on your computer. This is a minimum requirement of video editing, editing computer. More than two gigabyte RAM. In fact, this is obsolete. This lecture was, uh, I think a year ago or a year and a half ago. Uh, even my phone now has six gigabyte RAM. So this is obsolete. And an ideal of eight gigabyte, gigabyte is also obsolete. Ideally, your computer must have at least 16 gigabyte, gigabyte RAM. What is RAM is random access memory. What is the importance of RAM? The importance is that your, your computer may have one terabyte hard disk drive. That's not the thing. When you're working with a software, that video which is stored on the hard drive is pulled out and installed on the RAM and you work on the RAM, 
and then you send it back to the hard drive. If your RAM is not adequate, if you've got only two gigabyte RAM, it will not allow you to use two, three, four uh, programs at the same time. So that is why it is very important to have a very high RAM value for your computer. Otherwise, you will really struggle with uh, doing video editing. It's because video files are very high files. They have got a lot of gigabyte to it. And you really need to have a high, a high amount of RAM to be able to work with it. You must have a dedicated graphic cards, okay? And again, this has gone up to four, uh, to eight, okay? So one gigabyte has gone out of the window. But you must have a dedicated graphic card. Most of these computers that you use have a installed graphic card, which means the graphic card is already there on the motherboard. They are not good quality graphic card. They are not good for video editing. If you want to do video editing, you your graphic card should be separate from the motherboard there should be a slot for putting in the graphic card because then the graphic card picks up these video images and it moves it very quickly into the RAM. So it's very important to have a dedicated graphic card, not an integrated graphic card. An integrated gra graphic card is no good. And the dedicated graphic card that you can use is called an NVIDIA GeForce or a Matrox card, okay? So if you want to do good quality video editing, you want to do good quality uh, recording, uh, and very fast movement on your computer, then you have to use a separate graphic card. On, on MacBooks, it's very difficult to install these. They usually come as an external connection, whereas on a, on a, on a Microsoft, you can very easily install this. Now, this is also changed now. If you're ever going to buy a computer, look for flash drive, okay, or SDD. Okay, the difference between a normal HDD and an SD uh, drive is that in an HD drive that you use in a computer, which has got one terabyte, two terabyte, that is a moving part. It has got a circulating disk on which the whole thing gets stored. And there is high chance that that disk can fail because it's a moving part. As compared to that, a flash drive or an SD card has no moving parts. Everything is electronic. There is no mechanical part on it. Hence, on a smaller number of SD card, you can get more memory out of it. Though most of the current computers will go only up to 256, 512 GB, but they are much, much, much faster than a one terabyte memory uh, in, in a computer because these process the, the, the data much faster. So always look for SD card or a flash drive. That is what you must have. And you cannot do video editing until till and unless you have a 21 to 27 inch monitor, okay? This is what you need. This is the setup that you need. And in fact, now my thing has changed dramatically. I've got even more setup there and all the, you know, AV sending files and uh, talking, sending these uh, things. So you must have a suite by yourself, okay? So what are the softwares available for you? Apple, best. If you're doing images, if you're doing videos, if you're doing anything, Apple is the best. iMovie with Final Cut Pro, beautiful combination. iMovie is okay for the average guy. Final Cut Pro is for the professional guy or somebody who wants to learn more about video editing. But Final Cut Pro allows you many more functionality within the video to edit it to a high level. If you don't have Apple, then you can use Windows. And if you're going to use Windows, then Windows comes with the movie maker which is an inherent uh, software like uh, iMovie in Apple. But really, you got to look at Adobe Premiere and CS5 is out of the date. It is CS8, I think, or nine that has come in now. So you really need the latest Adobe Premiere. This is the one that you must use for all video editing. Mutu, switch off your phone. Uh, switch off your microphone. Okay, so that's your basic software. If you want to use other software, you've got Uli, you've got Alias Video Editor, you've got Pinnacle. Uh, Mutu, please switch off your, soft, uh, your microphone. Mutu. Thank you. Okay. These are... These are non propriety softwares. You can use these, but they don't have the same level of functionality as Adobe Premiere or Final Cut Pro. So my suggestion to you is if you want to start learning how to edit a video, please start using Adobe uh, Premiere CS, uh, whatever is the latest number, or Final Cut Pro. Now, whenever you do this, you 
it's not just the editing software. You must have a converting software on your desktop. So all of us have something or the other. I, I use Smart Converter. You can use AVC. You can use Free Studios because very often the file output is of a certain type, like a .avi, and then you want to put this video into your PowerPoint presentation. You have to know that .avi is not accepted on a PowerPoint presentation. Very often, I've had people stand on the podium and project their image, and they they say, "Oh, the movie is not working. The movie is not working because the dot." file was not correct that is why you need to have a video converting software on your laptop which will convert your video into the appropriate uh, uh, format that is accepted either by powerpoint or youtube or whatever is the other website that you're sending to so almost all of us who send any sort of video to youtube will have a converter and most of these can be available as free software uh, but you, if you want to do more, then you'll have to buy them. Now, whenever you do this, not just a thing, you also need a burning software. Okay, and a burning software is Nero and Toast. These help you to fine tune your uh, fine tune your video so that you can then get into uh, so that you can get a good end result. And if you want to send it as a DVD to somebody, you do need a good burning video to be able to send it to uh, a DVD. Now, this is just the basics of the of, of, of editing. You, you want to create effects. You want to show uh, you know, your background effect. You want to show thoracic gurus at AZK. Then you have to use other softwares. Softwares which take the video that you have edited and they do what is called as post-processing. So you need to have Adobe After Effects, which works really beautiful for creating effects, for putting in all things like that into it. So how to learn software? Most of us learn it by online courses. I personally do a lot of uh, forums. I go to a lot of forums and I you know, click around and every time I have a problem, I will put it on the, on the forum and somebody will answer there. So there are very lot of interactive forums that you can do. Uh, editing tips, important thing, you must have a junior editor who takes your video from three hours to 20 minutes. And then you work at the last phase. This is the most difficult part because you know what is the message. That is the key thing. Uh, always, always, always tell a story. Whenever you see my video or whenever you see my presentation, you have to understand that it has to be directed to the common man. You have to assume that the person opposite you knows nothing about it. And when you make the video, it's not, not just some recording of intraoperative things. It has to be a story. There has to be a title. There has to be a start. There has to be a middle and there has to be an end to the video. That's how you make a movie. When you see a movie, if I randomly showed you some films, film clips put together, it will never sell. But the real thing is if you put all of these with still images and text to explain all the things that you're doing. If you see a Khalid Emer video, you will realize it always tells a story. And most importantly, when you do your video, please watermark your video at the end in the background so that your name stays on the video, no matter who copies it. So people cannot reuse it without your permission. So if they reuse it, your name will come up. So it's important. It's your work, your hard work. You have to watermark your video. Now, just to show you a sample, this is a story. Just one second, okay? Just, just to show you, this is a story which is starting. And the story is starting in the world, somewhere in a country called as India. There is a place called as Gurgaon, and there is a hospital called as Medanta the Medicine. Do you understand? That is what this image is coming in. I'm telling a story. I'm starting the story. Once upon a time in the world, there was a kingdom uh, called as India with a uh, whatever, uh, the prince was called uh, Ali Zamir Khan, whatever. You know, I'm telling a story. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Let me just come back to this. So you have to start with the story very nicely and gently. Every movement has to be slow, steady. You have to start off with things. You've got to tell what you're doing. And as you're doing, you stop. See, I just paused it with a still. I did not continue with the video. I put in a still and I put in a uh, title into it, a subtitle. The subtitle 
is now starting to tell me doing that. So it is very nice. To, music should not be there. I personally uh, nowadays don't do music. This was much before when I when I was doing them. I used to put music, but now I don't put music. I actually put a background uh, audio text to tell you what exactly I'm doing. Now see here, all I have done is actually I have paused the video and I have actually put an explanation what is the structure that I'm taking. So it's very, it makes a huge difference to the audience impact when you pause the video and you tell the structure. So it, it, it's quite important that you tell the whole story. You must never ever just zoom past the video. Again, see, I've paused the video and put in an explanation. And <clears throat> as you go through this, that's fine. I, I, it's not about this video. Then we are talking about what we are doing next, but most importantly, you have to end the video with an ending. You never end the video just here. Just finish, thank you very much, uh, God bless you. You actually have to end the video with an outcome. What was the outcome of your thing? And you end it with the whole thing, and then it merges into the next one. So it's very important to tell a story when you're making a video. So before editing, you have to actually write down what is the message I want to give with this video? This is not just about aortic valve replacement. I actually want to tell people that any patient with a calcified aortic valve, uh, with a uh, aortic stenosis can actually have this surgery. These are the special points of my surgery. So when you start, you start with a CT scan or an echocardiography to show the pre-operative uh, story of the picture. Uh, and then you go on to the pathology, then you go on to the operative video. Most important thing is always save the original footage. As I told you, my original footage is always off the computer, never on the computer. And I always work, any editing I do, I work it from uh, a backup copy. I make a copy and I work from the copy so that the original is always saved. Never, ever, ever delete any original recording. Even the movement parts of it and things, some things you can actually use it in a story. You'll be surprised very often in a story when you see the hero on, on a horse going fast, very often the camera moves onto the ground and shows the ground moving by. So that is not a, a mistake. It's actually deliberate to show speed. So you can use very bad parts and use it as part of a movie or a story. Uh, rendering, I used to do it overnight, but now uh, because I have better computers and better softwares, I do it as I go along, but the older computers will all need to be rendered. It's very frustrating. Um, you always need to render to the need of the website. So make sure that you fulfill the criteria of what the website wants or what YouTube needs. But nowadays the softwares have become much better and they can do it for you automatically. But the quality of the video definitely goes down when you do that. Remember this, these are the only ones which are compatible with PowerPoint. .move, .mpeg and .mp4. The others don't work. Uh, .avi certainly doesn't work. And the worst time to find out is when you're on the stage with your video playing. That's never ever done. Always make sure you save the movie file and your PowerPoint presentation in the same folder. And when you put it into the preview room, put the folder into the preview room. Don't put just your PowerPoint. Again, 90% of the times people don't are not able to run the videos on the PowerPoint because they have not put the movie file in the same folder because the PowerPoint reads the movie file. It understands where is the movie file and it reads from the movie file. If you move the movie file somewhere else, the PowerPoint will not know where is the movie file and it will never play on the PowerPoint. Uh, .avi, .word, .flv do not work in PowerPoint. Maximum people make this mistake. They don't even know what is the end of their video. Is it saved as a .avi or a .flv file? Most people don't realize it. So it's very important to understand that you have to save it in the ones that are compatible with your presentation. Uh, this is old stuff, yeah, this is all. We've got lots of things which you've done. Lots of papers have come out of this. The most important thing is whenever I'm sitting in an audience, I am trying to pick up my next partner, the next student I'm going to push. So I really want to know uh, what you have done. And the best way is to, is to you know, uh, 
is to get a really good video. The video tells the whole story. It tells me how good a person you are, how efficient you are if you've taken care of the finer points. If you ever find a presentation with a spelling mistake, not acceptable. It's not acceptable at all. I would not hire anybody who makes a spelling mistake in a PowerPoint. So the videos are the best way to tell your story because at the end of the day, you're selling it to the people. Now see this, this is ITV news, uh, sorry, some news website. And what I'm really proud about is that when they wanted to tell the story, they actually used my video editing. These are professional people. But when they are talking about the whole thing, they actually used my video. These are my original videos, not one shot with them. And this is my editing that has gone onto the, onto the TV news. These are professionals and they can understand what, what is the quality of a recording and what is the quality of a, this thing. So watch how they're using my videos, my recordings, and they're putting it out there for general public. So it, is, it really makes a big difference. And most importantly, I pick up people for jobs when I'm, uh, when I'm sitting in the audience, when, people is, when somebody is presenting and he presents a nice crisp video, I know this is the guy I want for my job because A, he will help me with my videos. And more importantly, I know that he looks after the minor points and that will reflect in his work when he's seeing patients. So it's very, 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 very important. Now, I have shown this before many, many times, but I love this slide. The reality is that if you want to fly like an eagle, high up, high up, if you want to fly like an eagle, you can never hang around with the turkeys. The turkeys will give you 100 reasons why you cannot succeed in life. They will tell you every reason why you cannot succeed in life. Success has a price and you have to pay the full price for it. There is no shortcut. There is no compromise. You have to learn the minor points and promise you careers are made nine to five, but the real successful people are the ones who make a difference in the evening, five to nine, because that is your time. It is your life. And whatever you do between hours of five to nine will directly decide what, where you're going to end up 10 years down the road. I promise you this. Because five to nine, you're working for a hospital. Uh, nine to five, you're working for a hospital. You're working for somebody else. But when you sit at home and you do a presentation, you do a video editing, you write a paper or you do something else, that is actually going to take your career to places. And please, please, please make sure you hang around with the correct people who will tell you the success story and they'll tell you how to be successful so that you can fly high alone. Thanks very much, guys. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Excellent. Excellent, sir. <laughs> really Excellent. needed. Uh, very dose. This is Daily dose. Pause recording. Daily dose. <laughs> <laughs> you need to work with me. For daily you are giving. That is why I start my lectures at 5 o'clock. No, but we are getting time. digital daily dose. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, this is my time. That's why I start lectures at 5 o'clock. Between 9 to 5, I work for somebody else. But after 5, I work for myself. Whatever I do gives me great pleasure. And I want to, you know, that is the only thing that makes a difference. Okay? All right. Yes, Come on. Anybody um, has any questions on video editing? So, uh, so there are professional... Hello? Yeah, who wants yes, to? Go on, go on. Go on. Okay. So I just have one... Okay, okay. So there are professional video editors, the ones who uh, do, yeah, yeah. you know, they reduce yeah, the... They are available, but Shilpa, they don't know the steps of the operation. Then how do you do it? Then whom you catch it? Like, whom no, do you, no, you take? Give them, they give them, you give it to them so that they can reduce it from three hours to 20 minutes. So they take away all the gaps and all these non-specific movements. Oh. But intra-op movements you need to do because yeah, what exactly. is the message you want to give depends on you. So you have to give that message. Okay, so yes, there are professional, they're expensive as well. They're, they're not easy, they're not cheap. So, you know, if you've got a lot of money, then you can do it. Uh, when I was young, uh, your age, Silpa, for sure, I was doing my own video editing because I didn't have the money to, to pay the professional editors. But uh, if you've got money, you can pay, man. Not a problem. Mm -hmm.
Okay. Next question. Vikas Kumar Kisri. You want to ask me something? No, sir. This was this was excellent. He's speechless. <laughs> this was an excellent, excellent answer. Yeah, this is this is a different thought process. This is to show you how you can succeed in life. It's not all about surgery. It's about how to get yourself out there. I promise you. You can. There are a lot of people who do bloody one surgery and send ten videos. You know, they become uh, masters on the basis of videos. So it is very important to get a good video. The message comes across very clearly when you get a good video. Okay, guys. Chalo. Thank you very so, much. So, so very one, just, one last thing, sir. Yeah, who was that? Yeah, sir, Andre, Andre. Tell me. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, you said uh, we talked about uh, the capture device that has to be uh, 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 HD or... Uh, but then uh, can the capture device, uh, can that not be uh, your phone, provided it is capable of recording in 4K yeah, or yeah, HD 1080? You can, whatever is the capture device, it's the specification that's important, not the capture. Okay. Nowadays, Apple iPhone gives you a better, uh, better image than a lot of Canons, you know. Mm. Honestly, I, I, have a, I bought myself a mirrorless camera. Okay, recently I just bought a mirrorless camera for uh, broadcasting and all that. But I promise you, the Apple, I, I got Apple 11 Pro and that gives you a better image than the bloody mirrorless camera. In India, you don't need to use Apple I, uh, iPhone 11, man. Uh, Redmi Note 8, it's got such phenomenal specifications <laughs> that, you know, it's better to buy a phone like that because every year you can change it. No problem, 12,000, 13,000, okay, one year, you throw it away. If the screen breaks, don't worry about changing the screen. Buy a new one. Apple, you buy one lakh you've paid. You want to hang on to it for dear yes. life. So you don't change it, you know, for three years. So it, it, it's different. But my problem is because I've got all Apple and Mac environment. Uh, I have bought Apple. I never used to use iPhones. But now just had to integrate everything. Plus these AirPods and all work very well with the iPhone. So that's why I go Apple and images all Apple, never uh, never Windows. Windows is a terrible system, <laughs> sorry. Okay. So once you start using Apple, you will never ever go back to Windows. All right. Okay. All right. So, you know, I, I'm not saying you have to spend a lot of money. That's the important thing. You have to Problem fix your budget. Apple Fix your budget. Spend it. Find problem out what Apple is your is budget and then get the highest product. number within that budget. Sorry, because you're saying? The problem with Apple is they make so good products and every year they upgrade it. So <laughs> by you the time you, have, you think that you are able to read it, there are four or five versions there. That is true. That six, is seven, true. Eight, in, within two years, business they are now to 12. <laughs> it's all business, my friend. It's all business. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> I, I tell you, now I, I am... I have at least four iPads in my house, okay? And, yes. and my, my children take away the newer ones and we are <laughs> left with the older ones. And when I touch the older ones, it is, it's so slow. I can't even imagine how I used to work on that. So the, the iPad is lying in a corner there, you know? So it, it, it's just, they slow down their devices so much that it's almost impossible to work. Yes. So we are spoiling ourselves, I think, by buying new technology. Mm. We, have to, we have to balance it out. <laughs> okay, chalo. Thank you very okay. much, guys. Okay, Thank good you. night. Thank you so much. Thank you. So good night.